everybody, what's going on? Happy Tuesday night. We're back for another episode of the Bay Ragney Show, and I hope you're ready for this one. I am so freaking excited for – this is going to be an event. Trust me. We're talking to Steve Riley, original drummer and drummer of his own version now of L.A. Guns. But before we get into that, I just got to say real quick, this show and all of our shows happens – because of our good friends at Bombers and Sleeves. And they are the lifestyle apparel brand, and they're dedicated to bringing you the war on self-doubt. This is for the bold, the fearless, and the authentic souls who never back down and wear it all on their sleeves. Make sure to bomb your boundaries. Shop Bombers and Sleeves today at bombersandsleeves.com. And be like us people here in Nashville. Get the 6-1 vibe going on. And like I said, go to bombersandsleeves.com and get those amazing shirts. So, here he is, my guest of the night. I'm so freaking excited by this. We, we talked last year, but now we get to do it in person, not over the phone. The one and only Mr. Steve Riley of LA Guns. Steve, how you doing tonight, man? I'm doing good, Bay. Good to see you, brother. Yeah, man, you too. Dude, so, let, let me thank you on multiple things here. Like, uh, before we went live, Steve was actually early, which is a rarity. Usually people wait till the last second, but Steve was like very early and he let me run to the bathroom, pour a beer, and do all types of things to get ready. So thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you also for um, you know, last time we talked, I, I was just starting to do like the these video shows, and I like the whole time I was saying to myself, man, I wish we got to do this on video because it, I, I thought it would have been a lot better. But also too. Like, I walked away from the last interview because we touched on so many things, you know, with the whole situation with LA Guns and everything. And sure. We only, we only touched a little bit on the, the, the Wasp stuff, but I walked away, like, and, and I told you how I met you in Delaware, like, 10, 15 years ago, whatever I was at the show, and I was breaking your balls bad. And, and I walked away from the interview afterwards, and I said to myself, wow, like, I'm truly a fan of Steve Riley now. Like, he turned me, and I felt you were, like, very open and sincere with our interview last time, and I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you, brother. I, I hope to be, because, I, I, you know, I think it's it's good for people to just be open about their whole career. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and, and you were last time, and like I said to you before we went live tonight, like, I really want to dive deep into some things and stuff that I, me as a fan want to know, and I'm sure other people want to know. And, you know, I, I want to touch on the good, the bad, the ugly. And, and there's a lot of that in your career. Right. No problem, though. Let's go for it. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I actually teased you with this before we went live. You know, I saw the other day somebody posted something and it instantly brought me back. I was like, holy shit. Like, I had this interview booked with Steve next week. And I got to ask him because I didn't even ask you last time. And I got to witness this tour. I was a 15 year old kid and I didn't realize at the time, like I was just a 15 year old kid who was a huge fan of both Wasp and Metallica. And I was like, wow. now, you know, 35 years later, I'm like, holy shit, I saw history. I saw, I agree. I saw Metallica open for Wasp. And it, it honestly, Metallica was awesome, but Wasp fucking blew them away. That was an amazing tour. I've done so many tours in my career, and that tour with Metallica was something that really stands out. We we just had a ball doing it. We actually flip flop dates and let them headline on some shows, and we headlined on some shows. But it was just something that went off, man. Everywhere we went, the, the crowds went crazy. Yeah, like I, I guess too, like you know. At the time, Wasp was like without a true hot band. Like they, they were taken over like at the scene at the time, and uh, you know, with animal stuff like a Beast single. You guys were the, the band of controversy and and the future PMRC stuff. And Metallica, yeah, they were like the the metal thing up and coming. But the way I looked at it as a kid, I was thinking to myself like, all right, well, Wasp is the one that's going to be for longevity and Metallica was just a flash in the pan. It's uh, it just happened the opposite. It was unfortunate what happened with Wasp. I loved that band. I loved being in it. 
And I thought that uh, four members of WASP, we really had some great personalities and were making great music. And it's just unfortunate it was one of those bands that splintered and one guy left, one guy got fired, another guy got fired. And Blackie took it over on himself and he just went on with it on his own. But I thought we had a lot of legs, man. I thought we could have gone a lot longer with four guys. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I guess, so So Randy Piper was fired first. He was the first one. Well, even before you got there, Tony Richards. But uh, but Randy Piper uh, was fired first. Like, when that happened, did you think to yourself, like, oh, wow. Like, yes. he was, could be expendable? No, not at all. He was such a key component for that band. Right. He, he was not only the second lead guitar player, and those two lead guitar players, Randy Piper and Chris Holmes, they mixed so well because they were so different. Randy had a Billy Gibbons type of lead, and Chris Holmes had a like an Eddie Van Halen type of lead, you know, that type of style. So right. the two of them together mixing back and forth. It was just special. And then you get into Randy being the second vocalist. He was that second harmony. I was the third harmony, but him and Blackie together were very, very important. So when Blackie fired him, it was a big blow to the band. It was a big turnover from the band's sound too. Blackie taking over guitar and we brought Johnny Rod in for bass. It changed the whole dynamics of the band. I thought it was still a good band, but it was nothing like those that first couple of albums that we did with Randy. So when Randy was fired, it was a big blow, and I knew it too. I had been in music for so long before that, and I just knew that firing such a key component to the band was going to change the dynamics and the structure of the band too, and it, and it certainly did too. <laughs> Did, did Blackie like talk with you and Chris about it? At, like his like uh, like thinking at the time, like what he wanted to do, or did he just go and do it? And then like, oh, Johnny Rod's in the band now. No, it was kind of leading up to it too. There was a little bit of tension there between Blackie and Randy. Nothing that couldn't have been worked out. I mean, I, that's why I, I admire bands like Motley Crue. And, and Metallica and bands like that, that stay true to themselves and they work through problems and, right. and you just, you maintain. But that was something that was leading up to it. It was during the making of The Last Command and uh, there was a bit of tension between both of them. And it pretty much is Blackie's band, you know, it was, right. I knew it when I joined, I knew it was Black's band and he was writing the majority of the material. He was directing all the traffic. So when this tension came up during the last command, I kind of knew and we could feel it coming. And uh, we did that last command tour with Randy and it just went off. We did great on that. We went out with Maiden, with Kiss, with so many bands when we did it. Oh yeah, we did so many great shows. And uh, after that tour, he let Randy go and uh, it was leading up to it. It was a mistake. I think to this day, it was a huge mistake. But it was the first in a number of firings that Blackie did. He fired Black Randy, then he fired me, and then he ended up firing Chris. So he disbanded a great band. I got nothing but admiration for Blackie because, you know, he gave me a shot with Wash, but I, I really took advantage of it and I loved being in the band. But I think that. He disbanded a great band. We were not only good theatrically, we were great sonically, musically. We were just blowing bands off the stage, man. I yeah. thought that original four guys in Moss, we were great. I, you know, I, it, it's funny because so much was flashing back to me. Like when I was getting ready for this interview, I'm like, I'm thinking of that stuff. And um, I mean, the, those first, most definitely the first two. Uh, Wasp albums are just iconic. Inside the Electric Circus, it, you can start to see the change, but I mean, those first two, and, and I saw, like I said, I saw Wasp with Metallica, I saw you guys on the Inside the Electric Circus tour, and um, I ended up seeing him with Chris when they got back together for Hell Dorado tour, 
But every time, Wasp was amazing. I just can't stress enough how amazing Wasp was in those days. I agree, man. And I've been in so many bands, and I know that that band – we were slaying. We were just really every show, whether it was Europe, Asia, over here, North America, and Canada, we were just killing it, bro. And I, I felt great about the band. And I felt great about the first and second albums. And, you know, I feel good about uh, Inside the Electric Circus. But you, like you said, that was a noticeable change in the whole band, the sound of the band, and, and everything, that, how we looked, the whole thing. So, but I mean, those first two albums, man, we were really pushing it. It was great. Now, how about the, uh, the big part of the band, uh, you know, the bass player and drummer, that rhythm section. How was the change for you going from Blackie on bass to Johnny? Was it, as a musician, was it better with Johnny than Blackie or... Well, I'll tell you what, Johnny Lawrence, an accomplished bass player. Yeah. So you would think that I would think in terms of it would be a better battery mate. He was a good battery mate, but I, I liked what Wasp brought in the first couple albums because Blackie was a, a guitar player playing bass, but while he was doing that, he was steady. He was steady with me. We had a really good rapport as a as a battery team and uh but like uh, if you compare johnny to blackie as a bass player johnny's much more accomplished as a bass player because that's what he plays but yeah. i really liked playing with blackie as a bass player not only because he was steady with me but and he really didn't step out too much he was just steady mm -hmm. and it also added randy and chris as the guitar players so right. the whole dynamic was great together did you, did you ever say it's like like when that whole situation was going down with with him and Randy? Like, please, Black, you don't do this. Just just stay on base, please, please, don't do this. Oh no, I don't totally did, Paul, because you know, you're talking about him picking up the guitar and trying to replace a really iconic sound with Randy Piper. So you're not just getting a a rhythm guy, which he did. He became the rhythm guitar player. Right. Which the other two guys weren't. They were playing leads and trading off rhythms. So you, you're missing a big, big part when you let somebody like Randy go. You're missing the double lead. That double lead left loss because you ended up having Chris do all the leads. Chris is a great guitar player, but the big thing that we had was the two different sounding guitar players. And that was a, that's a big thing. That's like the guys in Priest. They sound different, they play yeah. different, but they complement each other. You let Randy Piper go, and you're letting a big, big portion of the sound go. That twin lead guitar and Wasp for the first couple albums was just great. Yeah. I, I wish he never did it, Bay. I mean, I think it was a huge, huge mistake, but it was like one in a, in a, a number of moves that he made, and he just came to just a, a great band, I think. Do, do you think if that never happened, like between, uh, you know, Fire and Randy and then yourself and then Chris eventually, do you think if you four guys stayed as Wasp, do you think it would have been a much bigger? Without a band? doubt. Without a doubt, because it was now in the mid 80s. It was like in 86, 87. We're talking about maybe dressing down a little bit too and, and yeah. shooting any of the glam or any of the, the ghoul stuff that we had, just being a band, we had a lot of legs. We had a lot of talent in that band. I think that we could have gone on for a number of years and done some great stuff. So when, when the situation happens where you eventually get fired, are you able to go back and like listen to like what Blackie's doing or, or are you – like me personally, I can admit, like may maybe 30 years later, I'd go back and, ah, that that's some good stuff. But like initially, are you like, I can't do it now. I'm like, I'm angry. I'm pissed. I can't listen to what he's doing. Well, you know what? It's funny too, because I don't purposely do it. But I, I, I when I move on to another project, I'm not really checking out the other project saying, 
oh, I hope it sounds bad or, or, or it's not going to live up to what we were doing. It's just kind of I moved on. I haven't listened to a lot of stuff Blackie's done since I've been out of the band. I know he's talented and I know he's done some really good work, but I, I wasn't purposely checking him out to see what he was doing because I got right out of L uh, a Wasp and two months later I was in LA Guns. So I was so invested into LA Guns that that's all I was thinking about. I, that's, I, I mean, I was just pounding what LA Guns was doing right. and kind of move on from whatever I was doing. I'd like to go back and revisit what I was doing with Moss when I was doing those albums with them, Last Command, Inside Electric Circus, mm -hmm. Live on the Raw. I like to go visit, revisit those and see how they sound, how they hold up. But I don't really know a lot of the new stuff or the stuff that happened after me because I, I wasn't purposely checking it out. I was so involved into LA Guns. Right. You know, um, it, it, it's it's crazy to like, you know, when occasionally, like, uh, if I'm driving and I'm listening to Sirius XM and I'm have Hair Nation on and I hear like Wild Child, like, I think to myself now, like, that is such an iconic song and such an anthem now. And, you know, off the last command, like, my personal favorite, Jack Action, like, songs like that, the, the stuff was, I'm like, oh my God, it's such blow away. And the first album, you know, sadly, you didn't get to play on it, but that first Wasp album is still one of the best of all time. Right. And, uh, hey, I just lost you, but can you still see me? Yeah. Okay, great. And yeah. now, the thing is, is that, uh, let me see if I hit remind me later. Oh, there you go, man. I got you. Okay. But, hey, yeah, you know what? Um, what I'm really proud of, too, is I know Wasp has had success, but I'm really proud that I played on two of the biggest songs Wasp did, and that's Blind in Texas and Wild Child. And yeah. those are two of the biggest songs that the band did. I'm really proud that I got to play on those songs. I actually brought Jack to Action In. That's a song that I had written about six years earlier when I was wow. in Chicago with a band called The Bees. And we, were, we did one album for CBS and we were gonna do a second album and I had written that song, Jack Action. I brought it into Wasp for Last Command and Blackie tooled with it a little bit. He put a bridge on it, and uh, but it was pretty much the song I wrote like about six years earlier. Now the funny thing, funny thing you say that, like he, here's my, probably one of my biggest memories of Steve Riley, okay? Going back to the days of the, the Wasp Metallica tour, um, Wasp was a huge band in Philadelphia, and I, I, I'm a Philly boy, and you know I'm, I'm in Nashville now for the last year and a half. Um, but Philly is my home, and, and you know I don't know if you remember this, but the big thing in Philly back then in, in the mid '80s was a show on 94 WYSB called the Metal Show. Right. Mark Dedea and uh, me and Ed Green hosted it, right. and every every time you guys came to town, Blackie would be in the studio, and I remember. I guess it was probably before or after that tower show, an interview Blackie did, where he said, uh, we have a new drummer, Steve Riley. He would, believe it or not, he was in a band called The Bees, and now he's in Wasp. <laughs> right. You know, and in between The Bees, I, The Bees was like in 80, 81, and then it was one of those bands. I had done a number of albums from 75 all the way up to 83, and uh, – they were a lot of one-offs where I was in bands where they did one album and for one reason or another, the band didn't get to the second album or it broke up. So I had done a number of albums like that. And uh, when I did the Bees album, the, the band didn't go on. It, it, it didn't have a lot of direction, a lot of management, but it had a lot of talent. And uh, Tom Warman produced the album. So that's how I got the new Tom and bring him in to do that. Uh, the uh, album for LA Guns, but the uh, in between the Bees and Wasp, I had done uh, like two or three one-off albums here in LA that that were gonna get picked up or they didn't. But I had done so, so much of that work, and then I did the Kill album, The Right to Rock. So I was. I didn't realize you did that. Yeah, I did the Kill album. They um, 
Porque, you know, Kiel, Wasp, and L.A. Guns, they are very similar stories for me. They all had their original drama. They were all getting ready to go into the studio or go on tour, and they let their drummers go, and they called me up. Kiel was one of those bands where they were getting ready to go in the studio with Gene Simmons. They were on AM Records. Somebody told me to call them, and they were going to let their drummer go. I called them. I went down, auditioned. They dug it, and I dug it too. I dug the whole scene. And Gene Simmons was there. So I got to play the whole Right to Rock album. And right after I finished recording the Right to Rock, I was still in the record plant here in LA. And we were, and the finishing touches of the Right to Rock doing background vocals. Actually, okay. me, and me and Gene Simmons were doing all the background vocals. And that's when I got a call from Blackie saying, we're letting our drummer go. We're getting ready to go on tour. Do you want to come by and check it out? I went by and checked it out. And it was a hard decision. Should I leave Kiel? They've got such a great situation going with Gene and m Records. And the band was really good. And uh, I think in retrospect, I made the right decision. I joined Wasp. I agree. I agree. And, you know, I, I love Ron and I, and I love Kiel and I have, amazing memories of that first Q album, but in the long run, I think he totally made the right decision. Oh yeah, totally. Even yeah. Ron, Ron and all the guys, I'm still really good friends with the Kiel guys. They're really cool guys. And uh, yeah. they even said, yeah, you made the right decision. <laughs> <laughs> now how about, I, I mean, all these years later, since, uh, you know, Blackie fired you, uh, have you talked to Blackie over the years? Have you talked to Chris or Randy? Yes, or I, Johnny Rods. I've talked to all four of them, and uh, you know, I saw Johnny in St. Louis when he's living there, and he and I saw him when I was on tour with LA Guns. Chris and me, we stayed in touch. In fact, Chris, when when me and Phil Lewis were doing LA Guns when Tracy was out of the band, we needed a guitar player to come up to Alaska with us. Chris came to uh, Alaska with us and played with LA Guns. So. Wow. Yeah, I know. Not a lot of people know that. He was in for like about three months and he did some dates for us up in Alaska. And uh, Randy Piper, I saw like a few years ago, uh, there's a band in Vegas called Sin City Sinners. Yeah. They have a lot of people that they fly in that are in well-known bands. And I got a call to come in. They said, do you want to come up? Randy Piper is going to come up too and we could do a bunch of war stuff. And then we had fun doing that. So I saw Randy. I know Chris is over in Europe right now. Blackie, I hadn't seen since I was out of Wasp until like about, ah, oh man, about 2012 when LA Guns opened up for Wasp here in, uh, on a bunch of dates here in the States. And so okay. when I finally saw Blackie. It was great seeing him. We hugged each other. We were happy to see each other. And everything's forgotten. There's no really hard feelings at all. That's good, man. That's good. I, I mean, after all these years later, and and I could totally, like, uh, again, like I said, just from talking to you last time and, and tonight, like I could totally not expect you to have hard feelings after all these years. I really don't. I don't carry them around, and I, 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 I I'm still friends with pretty much everybody I played with in my past. I, I just stayed close to them. I never really got in a lot of beefs with anybody, and I never really quit a lot of bands. And one band that I left, Keel, I'm still good friends with all of those guys. So I think it's really important, Babe, in this business to be cool with people. I think it yeah. goes a long, long way. I think that people that have attitudes and they don't get along with people, I think that the fans are smart to that. And I think that, you know, it's really important to be cool with people, be cool with the fans, and it just, it, it goes a long way. So, let me, this is my crazy mind at work now. So, as, as I'm going through and I'm, and I'm getting ready for tonight, I'm thinking to myself, I, I thought, wow, Steve, Chris, Randy, Johnny on bass, now, I don't know who would take Blackie's spot, but I was thinking, look, look what the, the guys from Dockin did without Don. Yeah, you, you had uh, George, Jeff, and Mick. They put an album out. Actually, they put a second album out. Um, 
<laughs> what if Frontiers came to you guys and said, hey, we want you to do an album with somebody on only vocals, the old Wasp guys. Would you be into doing something like that? Well, you know what I was into? I'll tell you, when I saw Randy in Vegas, he said, this is at actually the 30th anniversary of Wasp that year that we had jammed together in Vegas. He asked me, would you be interested in doing a 30th anniversary tour with Blackie and Chris and me? I said, absolutely. I said, he goes, you know, maybe like a short 20 day tour. I said, count me in. I would love it. And I would work it around LA Gardens. I mean, I definitely want to do something like that. Little did I know he had <laughs> he never asked Randy, I mean, Randy never asked Blackie and Chris. He had just, <laughs> <laughs> so when we approached them, they didn't want to do it. But I was totally into doing it. As far as doing something with Chris and Randy, I would never have anything against doing something like that. Those guys are, were great players. They're great friends of mine. And if something like that happened and I could work it around the LA Gun schedule, I'm totally down. As, as a matter, and I haven't seen it yet. I know um, Chris just put, there's a documentary just came out about Chris. Have you seen it? I only saw little pieces of it on the internet, and uh, I was surprised I didn't get approached to do it because I had spent so much time and we were just best friends. We hung together, me and Chris, all the time when we played together in Moss. But I did see pieces of it, and he's got just such an interesting story, you know, and yeah. such an interesting reputation. I, I kind of feel for Chris that he never got over the Wasp thing. And I felt like he could have been Zach Wild. He could have yeah. done that. He could have moved on into Ozzy, into Sabbath. He could have moved into different areas. For some reason it didn't happen and I felt like he cut himself a little bit short. I still got so much admiration for him as a guitar player and as a songwriter because he co-wrote a lot of those early songs. And, uh, but I felt bad that Chris never was able to take it to another higher step after Wasp because he certainly had a great reputation. He could have moved on. You know, it's crazy too. Like I got to interview Chris a few years back and um, I never realized like he, he actually auditioned for Ozzy, if I'm not mistaken, like during the, like as Randy Rhodes auditioned for Ozzy. He was one of them that auditioned like with George Lynch and all that. He was in that mix. Absolutely, man. There's no doubt about it. I think Chris was good enough to join a number of bands after that. And there were a number of openings after he was out of Wasp. It's just, you got to really want it. you got to, I mean, when I left, got fired actually from Wasp in 87, I went right into a studio to stay loose. I was living in a nice apartment in LA, but I couldn't play my drums there. So I had gone into a rehearsal studio just to stay loose because I knew I was going to do something, but I didn't know what it was going to be. But when the LA Guns guys came to me, you got to understand, I just headlined Long Beach Arena with Wasp. We headlined it, and it was packed, you know? And uh, I'm going to go join a band, LA Guns, they're playing clubs in LA. They have their record deal, but they haven't really done anything outside of LA. Yeah. So you've you got to really want to do something. You really have to dig in and say, I am going to move on. I'm going to do something, and I, I have to move. And uh, yeah, that's always been my, my motto is, like, I'm just going to move on. I'm going to do something. I might not know what it's going to be, but I'm definitely going to do something. You know, you know it, it's it's funny you say that, and the, the whole situation, like going from Long Beach Arena, you know, sold out, packed, to back to a club situation, like, and I don't think like the average person realizes how is that for you mentally as as a person. I, I mean, that's got to be such a blow. It, it, you could look at it as taken as a blow, but when they handed me the cassette for their first album because I was doing Live in the Raw when they were doing their first album. Okay. They came into that rehearsal studio because they were right next door and they handed me a cassette. The album hadn't been even 
pre printed yet. That's why I'm on the first album's cover, because I got in that early. But when they handed me that cassette, I heard the songs. I knew this band has something special going. They were part of that second wave of metal coming out of L.A. with Guns N' Roses, L.A. Guns, Faster Pussycat, Jet Boy. This is a whole second wave of metal. I was involved with the first wave with Wasp, Motley, Rat, Dawkins, and all those bands. But this was a whole new thing going on in L.A. When they gave me that tape, babe, and I heard it, I heard some great songs. I knew they were signed to Polygram. They had everything going in it. They needed a really good drama to come in and push them. And that's what I, I saw. I knew it looked like I was taking a step backwards by going from Long Beach Arena to the country club here in L.A. Right. But it was something that I knew wasn't going to last long. We were going to break out and do some good stuff. And that was because the, the material was really good on the first album. So, so as, as we're going to slowly segue now into to the LA Guns uh, realm of your career, be, before we get into that, I got to ask if who who do you think would call you first at this point in life to work together again? Do you think Blackie or Tracy? Oh boy, I think, <laughs> I think Blackie is set in doing Wasp as a solo guy and have rotating musicians around him. I think he's set in that. I think that once he disbanded that original band, that great original band, once he disbanded that, I, I realized this is what he was going to do. It was his band. He was going to call the shots. He was going to set the direction of the band. And that's exactly what happened. He has, he's had a rotating number of musicians around him for years now. Great musicians, but he's had a rotating set. And I think that he's set in that. Tracy, he left L.A. Guns. He quit L.A. Guns. He was out of L.A. Guns for 15 years. During that 15 years, he did a number of things, then decided to do another uh, L.A. Guns. And I don't know if we'll ever get... I never say never, because if the original L.A. Guns wanted to do something, the five of us, Mick Cripps, Kelly Nichols, Phil, Tracy, and me, I would never say never to that because I'm always into the classic lineups. I love it. And I always think there was magic in classic lineups. Mm -hmm. If it happens, it happens, but it's something I can't wait for to happen. And I don't know if it will ever happen either, you know? To, to um, let, let me say this, like, to, to, like you said, like there's always something about the classic lineup and the classic lineup of U5 and I told you this last time we talked, L.A. Guns is truly one of my favorite bands. And talking to you, and I've interviewed Tracy a few times, and interviewed Phil, and interviewed Kelly, um, it, it's truly an honor for me a, as the fan, because you guys have meant so much to me musically through my life. Um, it kills me not to see the five of use together. It kills me to see the five of use fighting. Um, but also, too, love to, to, to Phil and Tracy and they'll probably be mad at me for talking to you and I and I get that but the, the lineup that they have now in their version of LA Guns I truly feel outside of the five original classic lineup of you guys I feel this is the best lineup they've ever had to give right. them their respect right you know and I, I it's funny because I don't have any problem with those two guys but they have a problem with me and Kelly and Mick and I never understood that they trash talked on the internet and it's something that me and Kelly Nichols will not do. I will never go there. I'll never trash people that I've played with because it doesn't make any sense. Why would have I played with them in those early years and had so much fun writing with them, touring yeah. with them and doing videos and just pretty much doing everything and then later on in life, trash talk. I, I just couldn't go there. And I, I know Kelly Nichols is the same way. Mick Cripps is the same way. We just yeah. don't go there. But those guys have done plenty of trash talking for us. And we never got it, you know, because we had some special times with those guys. All right. Well, well let, let's, let, let's get into the trash talking they've done. 
and let's let's get the negative out of the way and let's then let's get into the positive of renegades and what's going on with you guys sure okay so first things first j just last week as a matter of fact um in an la guns facebook group phil responded to somebody had asked about your version of la guns and phil actually responded and he said i i i a quote uh, when asked about what his feelings about Renegades was, he said, it's a steaming pile of shit that was written and recorded in two weeks. <laughs> and that's wrong, first of all, on a number of, uh, of levels. First of all, to say something like that is kind of, to me, I've been in the business so long, it's so childish, Bay. It's really childish. The fans are aware of it. It comes off bad. I read that also, and I've read the comments after it. The fans don't dig that. They don't like it at all. And he said a number of bad things. And the odd thing about it is, is that Phil and I worked 15 years together right. with Tracy. And yeah. there wasn't even a bad breakup. He said he was going to do a few shows with Tracy. Mm -hmm. And it was going to be Tracy Guns and Phil Lewis. It wasn't even going to be LA Guns. And... I was taken aback because I knew that he didn't get along with Tracy. Right. Both me, Kelly, and Matt Cripps, we knew this for a number of years while we were together, while they were out of bands separately. They trash talked each other for years and years and put each other down. So when he said he wanted to do some shows with them, I was taken aback a little bit. I was like, really? You know, I was, I was surprised. He said, yeah, I'm going to do this for like about five or six months do some shows with them and then I'm gonna come back. So that's how we left it. No beef, no yelling, no going after each other. So I'm still surprised that he is so mad at me in the press and and going off on me. Again, I'll never do it. I won't return it to him. I won't say he sucks or any of that. I just don't right. go there. But you know, when he said that, he's also wrong on another area. It didn't take two weeks. It took two weeks to record it. But we had done a long pre-production over the summer. We were doing a pre-production for like about two months and exchanging ideas and putting songs together. Then I had the guys fly out here to LA and then we did a short pre-production and right into the studio. That's what took two weeks. We recorded for a full week, mixed and mastered it for a week. So we didn't write it in two weeks, that's crazy. So we had worked on the album for quite a bit, but you know, I, that trash talk and that even that quote that he made, I, I, I think that not only is it childish, but it's, it doesn't go over with our fans. Our fans didn't dig it. The comments that came in after, the, they, they, they're really coming down on Phil for talking like that. And you know, it is what it is. And I, I kind of let things slide right off of me. I can't let things absorb into me like that. It's, it, it, I just got to move forward and just stay true to myself and not cut people down and especially cut former members down that I had a good time working with. I, I just, I'm not there. I can't go there. You, you know, it's, it's funny because like when, when I, when I saw the comment, I was like, right away, I was like, oh shit, <laughs> here we go. But then it, it like the, the person in me that does a show like this, like I say to myself on one hand, like, damn, I wish he said this on my show. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but then I also say to myself, like, wow, like if if it did take two weeks to write and record, that's pretty impressive because it's not a steamy polish. It's a pretty damn good fucking L. Yeah, you know what? And the album we see so well, it's streamed on Spotify and the other like crazy it's out there with one of the top streamed albums for 2020 so it was received really well kelly and i we co-wrote all of the original material from la guns we're writers on every one of the songs that you know from the original la guns all of those albums we're co-writers so when we did renegades we were conscientiously wanting to stay true to the la gun sound and I think that we caught it. I think we caught that sound and we have a nice mixture of songs 
Kurt Froelich was a find. We really lucked out finding him. Scotty Griffin, switching him from bass guitar back to his lead guitar that he played mm -hmm. was just another really lucky move. We didn't have to audition anybody. The band had a really organic feel to it. And I think we caught that with Renegades. It was not only reviewed really well, the fans liked it, and it streamed extremely well too, man. And we did really well, man, on Spotify. So we're getting ready right now to put together another album. We're going to start exchanging ideas and maybe do something within the next few months and record another album. Oh, shit. Wow. Okay. All right. We're, we're going to tackle that. Well, let, let, let's tackle the other piece that I'm sure everybody wants to know. Um, uh, three weeks ago, Tracy came out and posted, I think it was on Instagram initially, he posted, it was a uh, legal document from the U.S. Patents Office That's saying right. that, he, that just he is legal owner of the L.A. Guns, you know, corporation name, er everything. And then you came back and said, actually, no, we're still 50-50 because what he posted is all the same numbers and account information that proves that me and him are still 50 50. yes it is babe it's the same thing what that document was that he posted said he is an owner not the owner both of us own the name 50 50. it has been like that for decades now and i'm the one who has been renewing it every time too and you know we both I know that everybody's aware about the legal thing and him trying to knock me off. That, that's not going to happen. We're going to come to an agreement. We're going to be able to take our LA guns out. He's going to take his out. And, you know, I think we sound differently as bands right now. I think him sure. sound differently than what me and Kelly sound like. But I needed to answer that because he was confusing the fans. And if you didn't look at that serial number or no, you would think, okay, this thing is over with. Tracy knocked Steve off and he's not. Yeah. Nah, that I needed to answer it. My manager said, you can't just answer it with a statement. You actually have to show. So that's why I posted the documents. It's actually something that I probably wouldn't have done, but my manager thought that it was important to show. No, that's not the case. We both are still 50-50 on this of LA Guns. We did it together. We did it when we were partners. And, you know, it was something that he was aware of, I was aware of, and it's been going on. I don't think that, you know, I run the business for LA Guns. Since I joined in 87, these guys decided, because I had a lot of experience, would you be the guy that runs the business for the band? And I, I said, if you guys want me to do it, I'll do it. So I have been running the business for LA Guns from 87 until now. And if I wasn't a full half owner and had that legal right, I wouldn't have been able to sign off on all these records we did. On all these tours we did, I'm the one that signed off. I wouldn't have been able to do that if I wasn't legally an owner of the name. So I think people have to look at that, that I signed off on so many albums for the band. I signed off on so many tours, merchandise deals, and I just wouldn't have been able to do it if I wasn't legally one of the owners. Well, I, I mean, how about how was that though? Like, you, you go from 1987, a situation where you're fired on one hand from Wasp, and then you're into this new band. You know, just signed a Polygram. Everything is coming together, and then like. How soon were you instantly put in charge? It sounds like it right. sounds pretty quick. Right away, man, because they had a machine built around them, a management, an agency, a, uh, a, a, a merchandise deal, and a, an accountant. They had this machine built around them. And when I joined, I had just come from the WASP machine, which was the Iron Maiden machine. It was the same thing. We were managed by the Iron Maiden people. We had the Iron Maiden agency, merchandise, accounting. I knew that the people that they had around them were not going to be able to take the band to the next level. And the next level was radio. 
The next sure. level was taken to be in the radio. You'll notice that the first album had a lot of great songs on it, but not a lot of radio. The second album that I did with them, that had tons of radio with Never Enough, Ballad of Jane, Lippin' Tia. It was a number of songs that went to radio. So what happened was they put me in charge of the business. I told them I'm going to have to rebuild the machine from scratch. We were going to have to let everybody go. That's where I went out on my own, and I found Alan Kovac, who's now managing Motley Crue. Yeah. I found him because he had had a system with some of his artists to take them to radio. I interviewed a number of, of managers on my own when I was in LA Guns at the beginning. I found a new agency for them, and I found a big agency with Bill Elson, and I found them a new merchandise deal and a new accountant. So I rebuilt the entire machine for them, but you know, I'm, I, it's not like I want to take so much credit. I just knew that they needed to have a bigger machine around them. After being with the wash machine, seeing what they did, I knew LA Guns needed to do that. So I did that. And from that point on, I mean, actually before that, I've been running the business. They, I was the president of the LA Guns Corporation. I mean, they made me, yeah, they made me in charge. So, I mean, I, I have been hands-on involved since I joined LA Guns. When they were a club band, so right now, I mean, I've been signing off on albums and everything. It's, it's okay. I guess it's not something I really want to do. I would like to just be the drama. I would yeah. love that. That would be such an easy thing to do. But if I needed to step in and help the band in any way, business-wise, I was ready to do it. With all the, at this point now, especially all the experience and knowledge you have doing that and running a band and all, have you been approached or have you been managing or helping any other bands? No, so actually a couple of bands have asked me that would I be interested in, in, in helping them with direction and stuff. And it's not really something that I wanted to do. I, I got approached to do it a couple of times. I think I could have worked for a, for a record label. I think I could have worked for a good management company. It, but, it, you know, I'm so into big playing drums. I'm a drummer. I've been playing drums since I was five years old. And, you know, I'm 65 now, so I've been playing for like 60 years. And I love drums so much. I love making music. I love playing live. And, you know, I've been so invested into LA Guns that this really takes up a lot of energy to not just be a band member, but to direct traffic to that's enough for me that that that's plenty enough right there but yeah i have been approached by a couple of bands and uh it, it, it's something that i said you know i don't know if i could really handle doing you and give you enough time while i'm doing it like that right. so i turned it down so, well I, I, let me ask you this too like with, with all you we, we know like we said like there's all this especially on the other side the, the bad blood that Tracy and, and Phil have um, what when Phil comes down and says statements like he has or you know Tracy has said stuff most uh, Tracy has said stuff on my show in, in years past and uh, Tracy put stuff out there does it hurt you more or anger you more you know what uh, it's it doesn't hurt me it, and it really doesn't anger me it, it, it surprises me and disappoints me it really disappoints me because, like I said, I will never trash talk anybody that I play with. Actually, I'll never really trash talk anybody in the business. I'll never put anybody down. They they asked me about a comment Phil made about Vince Neil recently. Right. And I got interviewed, and I just said it's, it's out of line. It's not cool. I don't dig it. I don't like going there. I don't like trash talking anybody. So when they say things in the press, I'm more disappointed than angry. I'm more disappointed than being, you know, like mad at them at all. I, I don't know why they would go there. They've gone there a number of times in the last few years and really trash talk both me and Kelly Nichols. And again, <laughs> Kelly is such an important part of the song. Yeah. He wrote Ballad of Jane. 
Yeah. So, so Kelly, that's a Kelly song, Ballad of Jane. It's the biggest song we've ever had. And um, how could you trash talk somebody that's such a good songwriter like that? Such a great band member, too. And I thought that I had showed up at every corner for these guys, in, from drumming to directing the traffic to whatever we had to do. So, uh, I, I like I said, Bay, I'm more disappointed than being mad. You know, when I when I got to interview Kelly last year with when the songs or singles were starting to come out, I I, I was more excited to talk to him not not only about my love for Ellie Guns, but the fact that he was in the band Sweet Pain. <laughs> totally. Here's a little story that a lot of people don't know. When Blackie fired Randy Piper, he said to me, listen, Steve, I want to put you in charge of finding the next bass player. So what I did was I put out the feelers and people knew, and I got a lot of stuff sent to me, a lot of packages, a lot of cassettes and, and photos. When Kelly was in Sweet Pain, he sent me his package. Now he was already a fan of Wasp. He had come and seen Wasp in New York when we would go there. Okay. He sent me his package from Sweet Pain. And I saw the way he looked. I saw the way I could hear the way he played on Sweet Pain. I we brought him down to the studio, Kelly Nichols. And he played. We had him learn two songs. He came down to our we had a huge rehearsal studio with Wasp. He came down, he played. I thought he fit perfectly. Not only was he tall, like Chris and Black. Yeah. So the front line would be really even. He had the look with the black hair. He just had everything going for him. And uh, I thought he was going to be perfect. Blackie didn't like him. And he ended up picking Johnny Rod. But it's a funny story. Not a lot, a lot of people wow. know that Kelly came down and played with Wasp for a couple of days. I thought he was great. I thought he could fit in perfectly. And then it was just magic that we ended up two years later, seeing each other in that rehearsal studio and going, hey, and we were together <laughs> forever. We were best friends forever. That's awesome. That's It's crazy how things work out, isn't it? It's insane, bro, because, you know, we had known each other before LA Guns, actually played a little bit together, and uh, we ended up being best friends for life after that and playing in a band together and doing pretty well. That's awesome. All right, so one more. Some people might take this or think of this as a negative, but I like. I actually went back and was like listening to some tracks of this, and I was like, no, this. I love this album, right. but I want to know what your thoughts on it were. L.A. Guns, American Hardcore. Oh wow, that is a story in its own because obviously it's the first album we did after Phil, Nick, and Kelly left. Mm -hmm. so Tracy. We formed a partnership. That was when we said, let's move forward. Let's do this together. And, you know, we're best friends, partners. We wanted to move on. Tracy was so into Pantera. Okay. So into that hardcore sound that obviously we named it hardcore. But the, yeah. the whole thing was he was so into that sound, he wanted to take a real big turn away from what LA Guns, it, it, you know, it wasn't a very wise move because we were already established with the sound. We right. had a lot of fans. So they were kind of shocked when they heard that album. It was heavier than ever. And it was just a total departure from the LA Guns sound. And it's nothing against Chris Van Dahl or Johnny who played bass. They, they were they were wonderful guys to work with and it was great but the departure from our sound was too much for our fans yeah. it was a lot of fun playing it because we just stepped out and i was doing a lot of double kick again and we were doing all kinds of interludes and going from jazz to hard rock to like speed metal and it was fun doing it but when i look back on it it was a little bit too much for the fans to accept and it was like what is this it's not, that really was not sounding like LA Guns at all. I mean, there's some stuff on there that I really like, but if I put it with the LA Guns catalog, it stands out on its own. Sure. Sure. 
Yeah, you know, it's funny. Like when I went back and listened to her, I was like, it's almost comparable to like when Motley fired Vince and Karabi came in. Like the Motley '94 album was that same kind of feel. It had that heavy, grungy, uh, you know, feel that the average Motley Crue fan is like, "What is this?" But then the hardcore fan is like, "This is badass." Totally, and you know what? It's like you know, uh, it's a very touchy area when you have a fan base already and you have a sound that they used to and they a songwriting structure that they very they're very used to. To take that type of departure is a really risky move. It could, might work, but most of the times it doesn't work. Yeah. It could be a really good album. The 94 album on its own stands, and it's really good work they do with Karabi. But is it? does it match up with Vince's catalog that they did with them? Not quite. And so it stands on its own as a good album. Yeah. Even American Hardcore, I think, stands on it, on its own. It has a lot of good stuff on it. Great playing, and it's it, it's well put together. But you're in a touchy area, Bay, when you try to abandon your sound and you lay it on your fans like that and say, "Sure, how we sound now." It, it, it's really, really a, a, a fragile area. So that brings us now. Let, let, let's go into the Renegades. How do you sound now? Because I, I'm going to say it, it's it's a departure, but it's not. To me, it's kind of like it has a tinge of classic LA Guns, but there is a different sound to it. Absolutely. You know, we tried to stay as close as we can to how we wrote with LA Guns in the early days. I think we accomplished that because if you look at the LA Guns albums, the first four albums, there's a mixture of songs. They go from different place to different place. We didn't write like 12 or 13 hard rock songs or rock and roll songs. We took it like It's Over Now or Ballad of Jane. It was a departure from Rip and Tear and Sex Action. So we really always had a mixture of material on our albums. I think we did that on Renegades. I think that we stay true to the LA Gun sound which is compact, good songs. And uh, I know that obviously when you have a different singer, it's going to sound somewhat different. But I also think that we lucked out with Kurt Fuller because he is close to what we were. He's close to Phil. He had a lot of respect for Phil. And he had a lot of respect for LA Guns. He was a big fan. So he wanted to stay true to that sound too. I think we captured it. We're really happy with it. I mean, with the time amount of, with, that we had to record it, because you have small budgets nowadays too. So you yeah. have to go in and pretty much do things quickly. I think we we captured a really, really good situation there. And we're, we're, we're totally happy with Renegades. We love what it turned out. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell you what, I told you this last time, like I truly am a ultimate hardcore LA Guns fan. And, and I'll tell you this, Steve, and, and this is no bullshit. And I'll tell this to any, any of the fans watching and listening or any of my friends who know I love LA Guns. Like, at this point of the game, and probably even for, like, the last 20-something-plus years, when it comes down to it, if I have a choice to listen to Guns N' Roses or yeah. LA Guns, I'm going to LA Guns. I, I always do. Now, wow. I'll sit here and I'll listen to LA Guns. To me, I'll listen to that cocked and loaded album is one of my top five albums of all time in my life. Oh, wow, that's great. And, and I, like, honest to God. So, and I told you this again last time, like, I'll be very critical and, and listening to, to you know, your version and Phil and Tracy's yeah. version. And like I said, like, your version is, to me, it, it's got that L.A. Guns bass. It's got a new, modern, it's even got a little pop feel to it. But, but I... I think Phil was totally off bounds by saying what he said. I really do. I enjoy it. I love it. And, and you know, it, it's it's Steve and Kelly's version of all he does. Absolutely, bro. And I tell you what, you've got two songwriters that were involved in all of the early material. Kelly was a huge, big piece of the songwriting. And uh, like I said, you, you got the battery of the early material, we pushed all of that stuff. We were the bass player and drummer. 
we pushed all of that early material. So you have that automatically. And then you have these two guys that came in and want to stay true to the sound of LA Guns. So, you know, there's a mixture on there. We go from hard with well oiled machine to a little bit of poppy to like, you know, we have the ballads in there. So it's kind of staying true to how we always put an LA Guns album together. So, and you, you mentioned this a few times, like that, you know, Kelly and yourself were very integral in writing in the early days of LA Guns, which, yeah. and I knew Kelly had, had some, you know, like a, there was a song off the Sweet Paint album that ended up on the first LA Guns album, uh, Shoot for Thrills. Um, so I didn't realize you really had an integral part from what you're saying in, in the actual writing in those early days as well. Absolutely. You know, it's funny too, because even when you look at bands, because if you look at our credits back then, all five of us were on every song, you know, right. all five of us co-wrote every song. I really believe that throughout my career, I always believed that's the way bands should be because you got to be very naive if you think that you go into a pre-production and the drummer or the bass player or the guitar player, if, if, if they didn't bring in the gist of the song, that they had nothing to do with it, they have a lot to do with it. They're going to put their final touches on it. you got to put an ending and a beginning, a bridge. They might not have brought the gist of the song in. That's exactly right. what I would renegades. All four of us write. We brought in the gist of the song, and then we let each guy put a suggestion in, maybe do this on that, what they wanted to do. So it's very naive to think that a band, any band, goes into a pre-production and not everybody has their little mark on that song. So when I was young and I saw the Deep Purple shared credits, I saw Van Halen shared credits, I saw a lot of bands share credits throughout the band. And I think that's such a democratic way to go because not only did that person, those people put their mark on that song, whether it was drums, bass, guitar, vocals, whatever, that it's a democratic mm -hmm. way to go because if the song is successful, everybody's successful. Everybody's gonna move ahead. So like if there is a financial success within a song, Everybody gets a piece of that. Everybody moves forward together. It was one of the things in Wasp that really didn't happen. Lacky took credit on all the songs, but again, you're going to be naive if you think that we were in that pre-production and we weren't doing stuff that we brought in, that suggestions that we brought in on songs. But I always believed in the democratic way of a band sharing credits on songs because I always know that people are going to put their mark on that song in a pre-production before we go on and record it. Yeah, you know, I, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. It's funny, like, a, as a fan, as a kid growing up, and, you know, in the days of, you know, you're sitting in your bedroom, and you have the vinyl out, and you're, you're staring at the vinyl as you're listening to it on the turntable, and you see the songwriting credits, and, like, Molly Crew, for instance, you would look at, like, you know, there's albums, and you would see just six, 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 six Lee, and you'd be like, well, how Tommy get a, uh, two cents in there? Like, you know what I mean? Like, how did that happen? And well, then when you would see bands like Ellie Guns, it was like all five, you're like, wow, okay, that's the way it should be. I, I really always believed in that because it might be hard to, to imagine that even a band like Motley, they're so distinctive players with Mick Mars, Tommy Lee, and Vince, that I know that Nikki might have brought in the gist of the song. But when you're in pre-production, it's hard to believe that Tommy didn't add a lot to it with his style, that Mick didn't have a way of attacking that guitar, and Vince right. too. So it, 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 it's the way they wanted to do things, and I respect that. That's how they wanted to do it. They each wrote the song, or brought the gist in, and it was their song. And a lot of bands do that. But I just find it hard to believe any band is in a pre-production and that whole band isn't putting their touch on that song. So it's always something that's been very important to me since I joined LA Guns, that we share credit on no matter who brings in that gist of the song, we're all gonna get take credit for it because we're all gonna put our little mark on it. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, 
you, I mean, you've, you've said like since 1987, you, you've run the LA Guns band and everything. But now that it's truly, you know, your version of it, is it even more? Are you the true soul leader? Is it a band structure? I mean, how, how do you look at it? How do the other guys, do you think, how do you think they look at it? I, I am totally partners with all the other three guys. I am doing pretty much what I did before by directing traffic a little bit and making sure things happen. But I really don't want to do anything. And this is what, with the old band too. I really don't want to do anything that the other guys don't know about first, that we agree to it as a band, and that they think it's a great idea too. I'm doing pretty much the same thing Bay I've always done, is be the liaison between the management, the agency. But if there's a date sent, sent in, if there's a schedule sent in, I bring it to the band and say, what do you guys think? So it's a very democratic thing, and I think it's just an important thing with rock bands to keep it democratic, make sure everybody feels that they're included in on decisions. So like I might be directing traffic and be the liaison to our machine, but I really won't make many moves without, especially with Kel, because he and him are so long and best friend, but Kelly does all the artwork and he, he'll send it by us and say, what do you guys think? So I do pretty much the same thing with any decision. I'll bring it to the band and see what they think. And then we'll make a call. Which I want to say, I, I saw somebody made a cake with the with the LA Guns cake, uh, you know, logo that, that Kelly made and all. Where's my slice? Nobody gives me a slice of cake. What's up with that? Come on, you know I love cake. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I tell you, I gotta tell, give Kelly props. Any artwork, any T-shirts you see from us, any album cover, any anything like that. That's all Kelly Nichols. He's got a great eye. He's not yeah. only a great writer, songwriter, and bass player. He's just got a terrific eye, too, for art. He does all of it. That's awesome. So now, live shows. You know, I, I can't believe, I mean, when we talked, you know, eight months ago, whatever it was. You know, it's eight months later. We're still in this, whatever the hell we're in at this point. <laughs> I see you guys do have dates booked. Uh, I think the first date is technically M3. Do you know what's going on? You have dates through May, June, July, Sturgis and August. What's yeah. happening? All of our dates from 2020 were pushed into 21, and right. none of them were canceled. They were just postponed. We actually had dates that started in March this year. And we've already felt a little bit of what's going on. Those have been pushed back. So okay. we got our fingers crossed. We have a ton of festivals, casinos we're going to do. And we just don't know, Bay, what's going to happen. We're ready. Right now, as it stands, our first show that's still booked is M3 on May 1st. And okay. then we have a number of shows after that. We don't know what's going to happen. Those even May, M3 and those May shows and those June shows, we don't know if they're going to be pushed back into the latter part of the year. We're ready, but uh, it, it's crazy, bro. It's so crazy. Nobody really knows what's going to go on. How do you feel? Like, personally, do you feel like, say if you had a show booked this weekend, do you feel personally it's the right thing to do, or do you feel it'd be better just to hold off right now? You know what? I feel like right now, because we're still in this pandemic and we haven't done the vaccine, vaccines yet for everybody, and it could be a number of months before everybody gets a chance to get a vaccine, I think the safest thing to do is kind of wait right now, not put anybody in that danger. It seems to be so easy to catch this in this this disease that you know why put it in I also have a lot of questions about how promoters are going to do these shows how are they financially going to do them because they might have to do half yeah half capacity maybe even a quarter capacity they gotta get people out in the shows they gotta hire a lot of security to make sure that the protocols are met it's we're in an unknown area right now, and uh, right at the moment, 
I'd like to see the vaccines get out there a little bit more and people feel a little bit more comfortable because right now I don't believe a lot of people have gotten the vaccine and people are wary of it. People don't know how to get it. So it might be better to push everything back. I'll tell you what, when it does open up, it's going to be a hell of a party. Oh, <laughs> it's going to be a hell of a party. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Big time. You, you know, it's, I, I, you know, I, I agree on, on everything you just said. And like, I've, I've promoted shows like when I was back in Philly, I've done some shows and clubs and stuff like that. And I used to be involved with the world of pro wrestling. I promoted shows and that too. And the promoter in me, just like you said, like, I, I, I don't know how you can even think about attempting to go into something like this right now. Totally. I mean, man, it is something besides the bands wanting to play and the promoters wanting to put it on. What is going to be in place now? How is this going to be pulled off? Are you going to get thrown out of the arena, the festival, the casino, if you don't have a mask on? Are they going to supply masks? And then how do you enforce the rules when people are in there? Do you hire 50 security people so they can walk aisle to aisle and they can measure people being six feet apart? There's so many questions right now with the entertainment industry and sports because I'm a sports freak. I'm a sports freak and I've been watching that and watching and seeing how they might open that up. And uh, it's so unknown right now. And, and I know the promoters are scratching their heads and figuring out how do we pull this off? What is the next step on this? And uh, I know eventually we'll get past all this, but I think we're going to have to get to that vaccine thing where everybody's at least had one shot and they feel comfortable. But right now, I don't know if a lot of people feel comfortable being around crowds right now, you know? I mean, I know that I I've been like kind of locked down ever since it started doing a lot of stuff on Zoom and on computer and doing phoners for interviews. But uh, it's it's not something that everybody's comfortable right now. I don't know where it's going to go or when it's going to happen, but I believe the vaccine is the most important thing. we got to get past that step and then see where we're at with that. Yeah, I, I think you said something really important, and I've said this to a few people like here in Nashville that I've been talking about with, with shows and stuff. Um, I think the sports world, because there's such major money involved in that world, I think that's going to be the true guideline of what happens with entertainment. I totally agree. And that's why I've been watching where they're going. I'm still watching basketball games and hockey games and nobody in the stands. Yeah. Football, the stadiums are so big, they allowed some stands, stands in, but they're all spread out everywhere. It's the only sport in baseball. Watch the whole baseball season with nobody in the stands. So, I mean, it's a guideline. It's absolutely the guideline for where music is going to go. And then I believe festivals will be the first thing to happen. Casinos after that. And the clubs, they've taken a beating. They've been closed for so long. A lot of our favorite clubs that we've played all over the country, they've gone under. They haven't been able to survive. And so... The ones that are going to survive, they're going to probably be the last on the list. They're, they're going to be, because it's such a closed atmosphere, that they'll probably be the last on the list to be able to put shows on, which is why I'm glad that what me and Kelly want to do, we don't want to do a lot of clubs. Like, we've done it for years. We've done yeah. like 250 clubs a year and, and, and gone on at 1230 at night. And we don't want to do that. We want to do a lot of festivals, casinos, and, you know, fairs, and maybe the one odd club here and there that works as a satellite show for some right. other show. But I'm glad we're going to do that, especially with what's going to go on right now, because I truly believe the clubs, uh, unfortunately, are going to be the last in line to be able to fully operate like they used to. It, it's sad, because like, like you said, like so many clubs yeah. have not survived. And, um, oh, it's horrible. yeah, yeah. Like, what, what do you think? I mean, that's just, yeah, it's just horrible for music business. It's, can, can you imagine as the, you know, the musician you are, um, 
trying to be a, a young guy in this game now, breaking into the music business. Can you imagine? Can you uh, even I, think of wanting to do that? It's already because you know before this pandemic set in, it was already really really tough for new bands to break in. It. it was mm -hmm. so tough because of the little bit of radio that rock bands get, the yeah. little bit of TV. It's not like it used to be. And the managements and the record labels aren't there either. So right. they already had a tough road, but they had the clubs, they had the venues that they could go and play and do a, uh, their thing in those. Now, I can't imagine how they feel right now because just the carpet has been pulled completely out from them. Not only was it already difficult, this made it uh, almost impossible for new bands to get going right now. And I really feel for them. So, all right, so you guys, do you have uh, any more videos coming out or anything? Or Well, you know what, obviously we're gonna explore doing videos for the second album and maybe doing virtual shows if that comes about. Okay. But we haven't done that on Renegades. We've just been streaming it and do we made a video of the making of Renegades and right. putting it on. And uh, we've been just doing a ton of interviews and talking up the album, trying to promote the album. I'm sure we're going to investigate doing videos and some virtual shows, but we're already talking, we're with the Australian company, Golden Robot Records. Yeah. So they're already talking about if the States doesn't open soon, they'll bring us over there to do an Australian, New Zealand, and maybe Japanese tour because it's all really close together. So okay. we're exploring those possibilities. So we're kind of like every other band. We're looking at every kind of angle, which way we could go with this thing because it's like I said, baby, there's so many unknowns. We don't know what's going to go on. We got a great schedule of shows here in the States this year. And we are like, you know, come on, baby. Let's, let's hope this thing opens up. And even at the very least, opens up towards the end of the summer, and we could do the end of the summer, fall, and go right into the winter. But again, we just, we got to finish across like everybody else in the industry. I hear you. So, Steve, I've, uh, I've bothered you for almost an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 got to, uh, I got to dive in deep with you and ask you questions. I want to thank you for uh, for being honest. Thanks for having me on, Bay. I tell you what, anytime, man. I'd like, I love to join you on your shows and interviews, and you just call me anytime. I'm there. I, hey, man, I I appreciate it. Where where is the best place we should send everybody to hear your? You know what? Let, let me say that, and then I have to ask you one question. Well, I tell you what, you know, we have just that LAGuns.net. If they go to LAGuns.net. You'll be able to find out about tour dates, the recording, what we're doing, what we might be doing. And, you know, there's a bunch of fun stuff up there with some old videos and the making of Renegades. we got our merchandise up there. It's a, it's a fun place to go. But if you want to find in, uh, anything me and Kelly Nichols are doing, we just go to LAGuns.net. So, all right. So now I have two questions. So the questions keep coming. Are you... Uh, a social media guy or is somebody else though? Like, are you somebody who's like into that whole world or? Not really, you know, I know <laughs> the other guys in the band. I know Kelly, Kurt and Scott are really into it. And they, they have their Twitter pages and they, they, they have their Facebook pages. And uh, I just never really got into it. I, I do check out some stuff, but I'm very limited in my abilities with the web too. I never really got into it to know how to navigate it well, but I, I'm not like totally out of it too. I, I check on some rock sites and stuff like that just to see what's happening, but I'm not totally immersed in it. Gotcha. And go, go uh, a, a slight touch back to the negative or positive, however you want to look at it. Have you ever gone back and listened to any of the Phil and Tracy stuff they done after you were out of their version? And I got to tell you this honestly, it's not purposely that I haven't listened to any of this stuff. I really haven't heard the couple of albums that they did. I think they did two or three albums, or a live album yeah. in the studios. 
I, it wasn't purposely, no, I don't want to hear that stuff. I just haven't heard it. And I did hear one song they did. It was a ballad that they did earlier this year. And it was only because it was so easy to navigate. It was right there on whatever site I was looking at. So I was able to click it on, but I haven't heard the actual albums that they have done. And like I said, it's not purposely, I'm staying away from it for any reason. I yeah. just haven't heard them. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> that was for, for, for my own little. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, again, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for letting me. I, I, I gave you full warning. I said we were going to go deep. So thank you for being open to it. Thank you for being honest. Thanks for doing this. And I look forward to talking to you more again. Much love and respect to both you, Kelly, Kurt, and Scotty. And uh, I hope to see you guys in Nashville, hopefully in 2021. Oh, man, I'll tell you what, babe. Definitely come and see us and come backstage, man. We'll hang. And listen, thanks for having me on the show. You're a good guy. And anytime you want to talk, just get, give me a ring. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Steve. Take care, man. See you, babe.